Welcome to another NFIB Teletown Hall. I'm your host, Kevin Shivers, Executive Director here in Pennsylvania. I want to thank our sponsors for making this series possible. Capital Blue Cross, Members First Federal Credit Union, the law firm of McNeese, Wallace & Nurek. Small Business Day at the State Capitol is Monday, April 4th in Harrisburg, where it seems you can't swing a dead cat in any direction without hitting a new business tax, a fee, a labor mandate, or a new environmental regulation. And joining us to talk about these and your other business concerns is Speaker of the House Mike Terzai from Pittsburgh. Speaker, welcome. Kev, how are you, sir? Wonderful, sir. And we have lots of members on this call. And so if any of our members want to ask a question, we want them to press star three. You can even start now. Uh, listen to the conversation, but you'll get into the queue. And uh, we'll go on from there. But Mr. Speaker, you've been a longtime friend of NFIB. And you know, does this show a force? You know, we talk about Small Business Day coming up on April 4th. You know, in this current circumstance, does a show of force by NFIB members at the state capitol really make a difference in lawmakers' minds? Kevin, without a doubt, yes. You, you have to remind legislators of the importance of small businesses to the economy and to jobs, and you have to do it in a tangible fashion. You have to tell them when you come to see them about your business, how many people you employ, how you have to find customers and getting service or product to them, what it's like to meet a payroll, what it's like to make a profit, what are the impediments in government policy, workers' comp, unemployment comp, minimum wage, manda mandatory leave, um, you know, th those type of taxes, how they, how they hurt your ability to thrive, if they do not see a face, if they do not know exactly how you are um, contributing to the economy and making, you know, making ends meet, they're not going to understand what certain policy items that they're pushing. I would say many of them negative um, are going to have a negative, are going to have a, a, you know, deleterious impact on on you and the economy. You have to get that message out. And again, for our members on the call, uh, press star three if you want to ask a question of the speaker uh, about uh, the, uh, the governor's budget or, or any other uh, concern that you have uh, relating to your business and policy in Harrisburg, star three. Um, now, Mr. Speaker, the, you know, last month the governor uh, walked into your chamber uh, and address the General Assembly. It was a budget address, and what was ironic about it was there was no discussion of the governor's budget. It, you know, it was a like a you know a, a, a talking to, if you will. But you know, one of the things that we noted was he probably would have struggled if he delivered the actual speech about the budget address. I mean, you know, billions. How do you, how do you impose a retroactive personal income tax increase? And you know, how do you think that would have flew during a budget address? It was interesting how he did did not make mention of um, the the tax increases that he sought and continues to seek. You know, um, his original budget um, address uh, wanted to raise the you know the personal income tax by twenty percent, the sales tax by ten percent, and uh, expand the sales tax. Um, it, it was to the tune of um, almost four you know thirteen plus billion dollars over two years time. And and here's the key thing, uh, Kevin. The fifteen sixteen budget, despite the mandatory increase uh, in the cost of the pensions alone, um, the contributions to the teachers unions pension increased from fourteen fifteen's budget to fifteen sixteen's budget by um, over five hundred million dollars on an annual basis. Wow. Even even with that type of an increase in front of us, revenues came in better than we projected, and uh, with appropriate belt tightening, we were able to pass a 15-16 budget that does not increase any tax. And and while the governor line item vetoed about 13% of that budget, which I think we're going to close here shortly, 
we can still finish off 1516 without any tax increase despite um, mandatory increases like the pension payments. Well, that, that's you know that's impressive. It, you know, it, nothing sparks the imagination like a like a spending cut. I mean, you think about the uh, uh, you know all the people that are on this call. Small businesses over the last uh, decade have been forced to trim their sales and do everything they can to make themselves efficient. And uh, you know, they're looking to government to to do the same. Um, and we you, actually, and have, Kevin, I, I have to tell you, I, I wish we were doing more along that line, and I think we're going to need to in sixteen seventeen. But that 1516 budget that we passed in December and that the governor line itemed, it, it in fact increased um, money to public education uh, by well over $400 million, um, much of that the increase to the pensions. You know, whenever people talk about public education uh, from the governor's um, administration, they never outline any objectives. They never say we want to get more um, out of the school system, or, or, or we want to uh, achieve these objectives. In fact, it, it, it's about, and we all know this, and, and we want you know good teachers in our schools, but that, that money is going to teacher salaries and benefits, right? I mean, that, mm-hmm. that's where the money's going to. Well, if you don't mind, let's, uh, you know, in, uh, in deference to your uh, coming from out west, we're going to get our first call from uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, when we go live uh, here, we'd like you to uh, give us your name and uh, what your business is. Hi, my name is Les Neely, company's Neely Canvas Goods Company. We manufacture truck tarps and we manufacture commercial and residential awnings. And it's been very frustrating for the taxpayers to see the long impasse for the budget. And I commend the Republicans for holding their ground because obviously the increases that the governor's looking at are going to be detrimental to small business. But my question is how do you work how do you work on, you know, next year's budget when we don't even have a budget passed for this year? Well, you, we, I mean, here's the thing: we we do have a budget for this year. I, I mean, I mean that's that that's the reality. Um, you know, we passed a balanced budget in June uh, on time. It increased spending over last year by about just shy of three point two percent. That's meant more money than I would have preferred. But here's the thing: we had some mandatory increases, like the pension contribution payments, and the rate of growth in the economy measured by the rate of inflation is less than 1%. Uh, I'm sorry, who does not sign a budget that's increasing expenditures by 3.2%? The governor vetoed it in total. It would have been our fifth constitutionally on-time budget. Remember, under eight years under Ed Rendell, not a single budget got passed on time. He, he thrived on crisis and chaos. But Governor Wolf vetoed it in total. Uh, I felt in a, in a petulant and, and irresponsible manner. We passed another budget in September. He vetoed that in whole. And then right before the holidays, we passed a third budget, one that spent $30.26 billion dollars which represented a 3.6% growth over last year's budget, included $400 million more for public education, which, as I said, is going to teacher salaries and benefits. And he signed most of it into law, just shy of 90% of it. So that's why government's functioning. Now, the media likes to say budget impasse, but the fact of the matter is some of the cuts that the governor made Many of us are, are more than happy to abide by, and uh, for all intents and purposes, with the exception of of um, a few lines in that budget, with the exception of a few lines in that budget, um, everything is fully funded. Now, we are going to put on his desk uh, soon what we call a supplemental to close items. But that budget will come under um, the rate of inflation while still increasing that dollars for public education of $400 million over last year's budget. 
and um, r- really, in, in in terms of government function, w- we are operating with a, 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 a an in place budget. Now, in 1617, um, the governor seeks. You know, I mean, he wants to increase spending from um, 30.2 up to 33 plus billion. Um, we're going to be very hard nosed about that, and we want to see the gap between revenues and expenditures driven down. And um, that discussion is happening in earnest. Yeah, you know, and uh, and and with that, I mean, you know, the, the there really is, especially even with some of the tax discussion, there's really no beginning or end, is there, uh, Mr. Speaker? Uh, you know, you had you know some of his tax proposals that were on the table last year. He's he's put back on the table this year. Um, you know, for the our small business members on the call, um, you know, not only was there the you know the personal income tax increase and the sales tax uh, expansion on on certain uh, business services, but um, in addition to that, there's they call it a business filing fee, which is essentially it's a tax for the privilege of filing your business taxes, which uh, is just absolutely maddening. And there was a proposal in the, in the governor's plan we read, because, again, he didn't talk about it in his, in his budget address, but we're, we read that he wants to tax uh, property and casualty insurance premiums, uh, and uh, he wants to tax uh, you know, possibly workers' comp policies, too. Yeah, uh, Kevin, the, the key thing in, in any sixteen seventeen budget negotiation, and, 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 and the listeners should, should appreciate this, is you look to how you drive down your increased costs over the prior year. So by closing fifteen sixteen at a at a lower spend, which I think will happen, um, and it has, prim- you know, for the large part, been enacted, and holding off on the personal income tax increase and the sales tax increases, we start off sixteen seventeen better, and then you look for what people call mandated costs of carry, and you try to drive those costs down, and then you solve for X. If you are serious about addressing a gap or a, a deficit for a particular year, you are not talking about increasing additional discretionary spending. You are looking for ways to hold the line on that spending so you can hold the line on the taxes. Look, we spend over $11 billion in state tax dollars on health and human services. We spend over $10 billion on public education. And between the state and local taxes, and local taxes do not happen in a vacuum, the state gives school districts the power to enact taxes. We are the sixth highest state, excuse me, in terms of expenditures on public education out of 50 states. And and what we, it's not as if we are shortchanging our responsibilities or our priorities in terms of government's responsibilities. You're listening to a live tele-town hall meeting with Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Terzai from Pittsburgh. If you want to ask a question, make sure you press star three to get into the queue. Uh, we're going to go live now to uh, Glenn from Ephrata. Uh Glenn, what's your question? My question, I'm a dairy farmer, and my question is, why is the governor opposed to most, if not all, ag-related programs. I mean, I, I can't speak for him. Um, he did veto many of those in the line item veto. And um, I, I, I really cannot, I cannot speak for the governor. I, I don't know. He never really articulated a reason for the v, line item vetoes that he he, he uh, did there, there? You know, it, it was um, it, it, it was just sort of capricious to a certain extent. You know, he just sort of picked and chose items that I think he thought in a, would have a 
you know, in a punitive manner would say to certain members, well, I'm going to show you. And um, I think some of the ag agricultural lines might have been, you know, to say to members who represent a lot of the agricultural communities, uh, well, I'll show you. Um, and I, I don't know, that's sort of a immature way to govern, for the lack of a better phrase. Um, but, but that's the best I can give you. All right, let's go live now to uh, David and Volant. Uh, David, you're on the call. Hi, my name is David Whale, and I'm owner of KW Home Improvements. We do home building additions and such. My biggest question is, as a small business, we're more of a position to see the growth and what's going on in the economy better than anybody else because when money's coming in, people are doing stuff to their house. People are building houses. People are buying property. As it stands now, with these tax increases that are going against sales tax and everything else, we're chasing most of the economy out of Pennsylvania. What is the legislator and the governor going to do to stimulate the growth and bring people back into Pennsylvania that's going to help us small business owners continue to thrive or even, for that matter, to continue even being in business and not have to move out to other locations ourselves? Great question. Um, and uh, I know, I know Boland's up in Lawrence County. Um, just a great, great uh, community. The interesting thing is, is the, the, what was driving job growth over the last five years was the development of natural gas in western Pennsylvania and in the northern tier. And it was not only having um, a positive impact in direct jobs, uh, you know, the average salary, many of them in, in you know, well over, you know, 70000 But um, it was also providing, you know, those uh, kind of jobs that, that serve the development of natural gas. And in addition, um, ancillary businesses like architecture, contracting, commercial leasing, um, truck sales, uh, auto sales, engineering, um, you know, trans uh, water transportation, uh, you know, w water clean, you, you know, um, you know, uh, recycling of water. Just uh, so many jobs were being driven by the development of natural gas. Now, here's the thing: we also had corporate jobs here too and back office jobs, Shell uh, had 180 jobs here, Western Pennsylvania. They just picked up and moved to Houston. Consol, Range Resources, Chevron, Southwestern, all with significant presence in Western Pennsylvania, have all laid off large percentages of their workforce. People who were spending money we're spending money in um, Western and Northern Tier and all over the state. We did, um, we went out and started to talk to vendors all across the state who were benefiting from the work being done in Pennsylvania. Um, a spinoff from Sunoco uh, took a pipeline that used to bring in Nigerian oil into Marcus Hook off the Delaware River, and they would bring it out west of Washington County to disseminate throughout the United States. That shut down. They flipped the direction of that pipeline and started to take in natural gas and its uh, additives, and they would bring that now to Marcus Hook, split off, you know, uh, propane and, and butane and ethane, and then, and then turn them into enes and started to distribute those items because those items are used in things like aspirin, balloons, crayons, diapers. Natural gas is both a feedstock and a, an opportunity to fuel manufacturing facilities. The governor's truly punitive approach to try to de facto shut down the development of natural gas along with the global economy OPEC does not want America or Canada 
or any place else developing their own energy sources have hurt our economy. Mr. Speaker, you you know when you when you compare uh, you know what the governor is doing exactly as you said on the natural gas side, and then you take a look at President Obama's war on coal. Uh, I mean, just death blows to uh, Pennsylvania's uh, energy, uh, domestic energy production. It's it truly is uh, frightening. Um, Want to go to Bernard now in uh, Dubois? Uh, Bernard, uh, what's your question? Well, I mostly have a comment. I've been following these issues for quite a number of years. I do have a small business, and I just admire so much Representative Terzai and the leadership he's providing, and I just want to encourage him to keep it up and to fight back. What we need in Pennsylvania is smaller government, lower taxes, and more freedom. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. You're very kind. Um, I, I, I will say that what we also need is um, we have to change the public pension system. You know, th- there are just a couple hundred thousand, um, you know, we have a, a couple hundred thousand teachers and uh, state government workers. And uh, when we talk about changing public pensions, we are talking about new hires. The present systems are uh, about estimated to be, you know, and that can change given the market, about 50 to 60 billion unfunded, uh, about 60, less than 60% funded, but around that range to the tune of about 60 billion in terms of unfunded dollars. We have to bring the public sector, at least new hires, into defined contribution plans 401k plans, and you know the governor vetoed that bill. It wasn't the best of all bills, but it was a, it was a move movement in the right direction. But we're we're going to try to run another reform bill and put it on the governor's desk that moves uh, new employees to um, defined contribution like plans, 401k like plans, and that will save. Uh, anywhere from 11 to 15 billion, according to the actuaries, over 30 years. It's a big, big change. The other thing is, is you know, we're 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 holding back on on the governor's attempt to increase the minimum wage. You know, he's he's doing it on his own with respect to state employees. I, I do not believe that that applies to um, folks that contract with Pennsylvania, but uh, that remains to be seen. We're going to be, we're going to be pushing on that. We also think that these local municipalities that have mandates on leave uh, beyond the federal government is basically making small employers pick up the cost for when people, you know, just pick up and, and leave for what, like almost any purpose. And um, I don't think they have a sense as to how people <clears throat> payroll. I, I myself, I, 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 I believe it or not, there are not that many attorneys in Harrisburg, but I was a business attorney after being a prosecutor. And uh, while unlike many of your good folks who run the businesses and have to meet payroll and have to find customers and have to make sure product is, and services are doing well, I, I, I work for a lot of those kind of folks in terms of providing services to them, and you get to know their businesses, and small business owners are the best. They're the best. And I do not understand why we aren't trying to develop more entrepreneurs. Uh, Instead, we keep putting up roadblocks to owning your own business, and and look, you folks are taking risks right at the get-go. So, you know, keep up the great work to everybody on this line, because you're – you're making the economy happen. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been doing these calls for uh, at least uh, 10 years now, and I have to say this is, uh, I think, a record for numbers of questions we've actually been getting. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go to uh, Judy now in uh, Red Lion. Uh, Judy, you're on uh, on the call. Hey, Judy. Hi. What's your question? Okay, I'm 
uh, concerned about the 4-H program that the governor wants to uh, cut from the budget or cut the funding. Uh, Judy, we would restore some of that those cuts that the governor made uh, to 4-H and, and other agricultural programs. Um, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent what the dollars will be, but um, 4-H is a, a, a valuable program, and it, and it allows uh, our youth to recognize uh, the, you know, the importance of um, the agricultural industry as a, as a form of, uh, you know, as a, as a way of life, as a form of uh, employment, as a form of entrepreneurship, and uh, also providing, you know, food and, and, uh, and uh, important raw materials uh, to people all across, um, you know, the nation and the world. Um, that's what 4-H does, and, and, and it, it, it's, it's very valuable in, in, in that regard. Now, Mr. Speaker, I mean, do you guys, are you planning to do a, you know, a veto override in that regard or like a supplemental? No, Have you really thought no, of a strategy? No, I, 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 a supplemental, uh, Kevin, just, okay. to, just to close off the additional lines. Our, okay. our hope is that um, many of our colleagues across the aisle, you know, a good number who we have a, a, a good working relationship with, that, that they understand the importance of moving forward. Okay, great. Hey, well, uh, I can't believe that that's uh, taken us to the uh, that 30-minute mark of this call, and we uh, we try to be respectful of our uh, entrepreneurs' time uh, on uh, this call. I'm going to go uh, one last uh, speaker uh, and uh, one last question here. And uh, for those of you who uh, can't get your questions asked, we're going to wait to the end of this call. Uh, you'll have to be prompted by a tone, and you can actually leave your message, your question, or comment then, and uh, we'll make sure it gets out to Speaker Terzai's office, or we'll field it and process it here in our, our line as well. Uh, so I'm going to go now to uh, John. Um, John, you're on the call, and uh, what's your question? Yeah, my question is for Speaker Terzai. Uh, I own a small plumbing HVAC company in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and there are two bills for a plumbing license, Senate Bill 703 and House Bill 1357. I just wonder where you stand on that and if you have any information where this is going. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, it's John, right? Yeah, he, uh, he, he disconnected from us, but uh, I guess his questions were relating to there were two plumbing licenses bills, licensing bills uh, in uh, uh, the General Assembly. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm yeah. assuming they're probably in Labor and Industry Committee. Kevin, what I'll, I'll do, is I, I must say I, I, I'm not aware of those particular bills, but I will definitely follow up and, and uh, get you a feedback on those. And Kevin, if you want to do one more question after that, I'm, I'm, I'm game. Okay, sure. Let's, uh, let's go to Rich in Newport. Uh, Rich, you're on the call. Uh, hello. Thank you, Speaker, for joining us today. Uh, oh, thank you. Back again on the agriculture uh, with the uh, line veto of the uh, land script fund. Uh, that we're facing the elimination of the whole Penn State Extension program. Right. Uh, up right. here in a, in a rural county like Perry County, this this is uh, largely affecting all small businesses. I'm a small retailer, uh, but it has all of us concerned in, in the community because this is going to set back all of us. Um, so we're, we're hoping that uh, SB 1120 gets some momentum and we can restore all of that. I know this has been asked already, but it is very important to a rural community like Perry County. No, no, and, and listen, I, I, if there's one item, um, you know, a specific item that, that I've heard most about uh, in terms of what he's cut, I, I would say it's probably the, ag extend, the agriculture extension. And uh, I know you've got a great uh, supporter up there in, in Representative Mark Keller and uh, up in Perry County, and, and um, I, I am sure you're going to see um, significant restoration as we move forward. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. Uh, where can folks go online to learn more about you and uh, your, uh, what you guys are doing? Yes, uh, www.reptourzai.com, and, and my last name is spelled uh, T-U-R-Z-A-I, uh, not an easy name, um, uh, <laughs> a Hungarian, a Hungarian name. 
history uh, for that name. And um, and uh, but please uh, take a look. And I'm so glad that you, your members were so great. And I, I wish I could have taken more calls. I, I'm glad to do it again, uh, Kevin. To you and NFIB, you are out front and you're on the front lines. And uh, to, to you and Neil and, and the rest of your team, thank you very, very much for having me. You bet, sir. And, uh, you know, as the saying goes, uh, you know, if you're not at the table, you're probably then on the menu. And, uh, you know, for our members, as we've been learning uh, on this call today, there's a lot at stake for small business this year. And so we hope to see you in Harrisburg on April 4th. Uh, where we're going to be uh, taking our concerns up to uh, lawmakers in the state capitol. And uh, so we want to thank you again. We want to thank our sponsors uh, uh, one more time, Capital Blue Cross, Members First Federal Credit Union, McNeese, Wallace, and, and Nurek, the law firm. And uh, until next time, thanks for listening. Hey, Kevin, thanks again. To all your NFIB members, thank you so much. It's, it's my honor and privilege.